Olá, gente. Um, sejam bem-vindos. Um, sejam bem-vindos. Hoje no seminário de, uh, de hoje no seminário do Departamento de Raios Cósmicos, nós temos a honra e o prazer de ter o Jean Kaspar. This is how you pronounce, right? Kash with sh. Yeah, this is correct, but then the, the first name is Jan. <laughs> Jan, yeah, Jan Kaspar. Yes. Um, so he is a, he studied particle physics at the Charles University in the Czech Republic. Um, Einstein used to teach there for those who for those who don't know. <laughs> he finished his PhD, he's finished his PhD in 2011, and he works mainly on the totem experiment, which is one of the smaller experiments at CERN. It sort of coordinates with CMS. Of which our um, of which our department is part, um, of which our department is part, and he works on forward hadronic physics and also on detector calibration and reconstruction software. Um, like I said, I forgot to say I was going to introduce you in Portuguese. He will speak in English, but I I also switch sometimes. I switch languages, um, and he um, ele vai falar the descoberta de uma partícula que é o ódero, né? bastante famoso se você faz QCD, mas também não é sempre muito claramente definida, porque ainda é um tópico de pesquisa o que é exatamente um ódero. We still do not fully understand what an ódero is on a conceptual level, but we discovered it. Um, vai ter perguntas depois do seminário, vai ter perguntas depois do seminário, se tem perguntas urgentes, claramente um, pode, pode me escrever. Um, if you have urgent questions, then please, uh, please write to me and we'll, we can ask, but otherwise there will be a question and answer session after the seminar. Um, and vai ter uma lista de presença, vou mandar um link em alguns minutos. Um, Jan, thank you very, very much. You can start. Thanks to you for, for, for your invitation. It, uh, it's a pleasure to, to present to you. Um, so I will be talking about, about Odoron. Um, I, I should say that I try to prepare the, um, the presentation for kind of students, younger colleagues. So I, I deliberately decided to skip some, some details um, to make it somewhat easier. So, but if, if you have some questions, then please, please ask. I will try to do my best to, uh, to answer that. So I, I go directly to the next slide. So on slide number two, um, this is the plan of, um, of the talk. So um, the first question, which is kind of fair to ask, what is the order on? Because uh, it's probably not a concept which is very well known um, through the field. So I will need to touch a bit of theory, phenomenology, and I will try to explain the language which, which we are using because uh, this might not be the typical one. Then in, in second part, which will be a very short one, I will try to outline, uh, let's say the typical experimental apparatus where we need to study these kind of phenomena and so on. And the third part will eventually be um, dedicated to how we convinced ourselves and hopefully also our colleagues that um, a state like Odoran, sorry, there's a typo here, uh, exists really in the nature. Very good. So uh, let me start with the first part. Um, first, I would like to mention a concept of forward physics and to be talking about something concrete, let me talk about forward physics at the LHC. So LHC, as you very well know, uh, is an accelerator, which most often is colliding protons with protons. And now you can imagine um, an event where at least one of the protons survives the collision and kind of continues almost forward. Um, this is not a class of events which would be artificially invented, but about one third of the LAT events is really like this. So there is good reason to study these events. Um, when I said that the proton uh, continues almost forward, this essentially means that the scattering angle is very small. We are talking about something like 10 of, or 100 of microradians. Uh, last thing which will which I will um, come back to you at some point is that the scattering energy, the square root of s, is very large. We are talking about something like one TV. And then 
really to follow the, the most simple, simple example in this presentation, I will focus mostly on the process of elastic scattering, which is a process where you have two protons in the initial state, they kind of bounce off each other and you still have two protons in the final state. Um, then as the protons, they really scatter to small angles, it means that they exchange a very small amount of momentum, which is somewhat important. Um, for what I'm going to take later, uh, the uh, four momentum transfer square, we call it T, um, most likely you know, this is the typical Mandelstam variable to accompany S. Um, yes, and then uh, here in this kind of Feynman-like diagram, you see this, this, this wiggle line, which represents the object which is mediating this, this, uh, this process, and this this mediator or exchange object um, has some interesting uh, characteristics. And I can already say that uh, the other one is, is one of those things. And this is the subject of the presentation. Uh, the next slide, uh, yeah, you know, protons are strongly interacting particles, and, and we believe that the QCD is the theory of the strong interactions. So, uh, we could believe that we can really use the QCD to get the get predictions, um, but there's a catch. The catch is that in forward physics, quite general, in elastic scattering even more, there is no hard scale in, in the process. I, I was talking about small momentum transfer between the protons. Uh, so what happens that the QCD coupling is high, this kind of an illustration uh, of that. So this is the, the coupling uh, strength as a function of the momentum scale in the process. And as I was saying that we are kind of less than one, so we will be kind of here somewhere there out of the, of the picture. So it's really a region with high coupling. And that's why we are probing the non-perturbative regime of QCD. And as you know, this is kind of very difficult regime to, to handle um, computationally. So essentially we have no first principle predictions from QCD. So of course, as the QCD is not easily applicable, people were thinking of an alternative. And I really put the alternative a bit in quotes because we, I mean, people were not really thinking or at least in the way what, what I'm gonna say later, it's not an alternative uh, in terms of dynamical structure, but it's merely looking for a language where some things might look easier and, 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 and um, easier to understand. And one of the things uh, of these alternatives is the Rijet theory. Um, I don't wish to go into detail, so I, I just wish to sketch the, 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 the basic essence. So as you probably know from, from theory courses that the scattering amplitude can be represented in, in, in different terms as a function of momentum, impact parameter, or the angular momentum, like the partial amplitudes. And these are actually the partial amplitudes, which are the basis or the starting point for, for the for the Regia theory. So you can take the the um, partial amplitudes A L of T. The L is the um, angular momentum, and you can try to think to generalize it into a function of the of the momentum L, where the this could be actually a complex number such that whenever the L uh, would go uh, to a real integer, it would reproduce the original um, partial amplitudes. And then um, under a series of kind of plausible assumptions, uh, one can show that this interpolating function has singularities and in, in, in particular the poles whenever L equals some function of, of the T. And this function alpha of T, it, this is called rigid trajectory. And then pushing even further, one can show that uh, in the T channel, this scattering amplitude can be actually written as a kind of sum over the rigid trajectories, which would contribute to that process. So this is this sum over this I. And then uh, the amplitude L A Y is proportional to the S to the power of alpha. So then the interpretation is that you can identify what are the Rigid trajectories which contributed the process, and each of them actually can be seen as an exchange of a rigid trajectory or a region. And then what is actually nice about this is that uh, if you would 
some would give you the list of the rigid trajectories which are supposed to consider and you would be looking at high s that's why in the beginning i was saying that at lac we have really large s then you can only retain the contribution with highest alpha because all the others would be uh, superseded by this high power of, of, of s so uh, you see that uh, only looking at the analytical structure there are certain statements which are very strong and kind of leading to a simple picture which can be made and up to now i i, I we, we didn't employ any kind of dynamical model it's just kind of looking at the problem from the right side and you can already tell quite a lot and this is why i think people really stick to this rigid um, theory language because it's telling quite a lot so the only remaining detail is to to find what the uh, rigid trajectories are, what are these functions alpha of t. And some comments of this are on the next slide. So this time looking at the S channel of the of the interaction, one can show that the the, the singularities uh, or the rigid trajectories actually correspond to, to bound state and resonances where the T uh, is can be um, identified with the square of the mass and alpha of t is the spin. And then here you see this is the plot which people made at that time, really kind of taking the, the mesons they, they know and they put it on the plot and you see the, the um, spin versus the, the mass squared. And what they found that actually the trajectory, the alpha of t seems to be linear. So this is the uh, simplest case ever they could think of. And again, they, they, they thought if this is so simple that, that there must be at least a grain of truth on it. I mean, of course, it, it's not clear that what you see in this um, kinematical domain of this S channel can be extrapolated to the T channel, but actually it works quite, quite well. Um, the next thing which is kind of uh, important for the next discussion is if you look here, that the value of the alpha at um, t equals zero is about 0.5. Why it is important is that from the optical theorem, which relates the total cross section, that is the probability that something, anything would happen uh, when the two protons meet, is proportional to the imaginary part of this scattering amplitude at t equals zero. And then from the Rajat theory, you can get the relation that the total cross section is s to the power alpha minus one so if alpha is 0 0.5 then this exponent would be minus 0.5 that's why uh from the rigid trajectory if you take only these trajectories here into consideration the prediction would be that the total cross section would decrease with energy um up to the theory, now a bit of phenomenology. So uh, here, this is a busy plot, but um, the only thing which I want to look at are the red points. The red points, they are showing the total cross-section as a function of the scattering energy. And then on the previous slide, I was saying that the prediction was that it was supposed to be decreasing. And indeed, if you look at the very low energies, it was decreasing, but somewhat, um, as of something like 100 GV, the cross-section was going up. So simply to reconcile the theory with the data, people said there must be something else than just the meson trajectories. There must be something new, and they called this rigid trajectory pomeron. So this is trajectory which must have the alpha at t equals zero greater than one, that's why the s to the power of alpha minus one would be an increasing function of the energy. And then second thing which I would like to show in this plot, if you look again in this low energy area, you see there are actually two curves which eventually merge into one. And these two curves, these are the measurements for proton, proton, and proton, anti-proton. So they are kind of split in the beginning, but for high energies, they, 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 they are kind of compatible with one, one function. That's why when, when people first postulated the new rigid trajectory, uh, they said this would be so-called crossing even. Crossing even means that 
the amplitude which would contribute to the proton proton and proton anti proton scattering would have the same sign. But actually, if you do this, you can also already say, okay, and what about an odoron? Odoron would be kind of crossing odds partner of the pomeron. So this would be also a trajectory which has the alpha kind of um, one or, or bigger. But still, this would be an effect which is significantly weaker than the pomeron. And most importantly, an odoron would be a crossing art object, which means uh, the amplitude which would contribute to the proton-proton and proton-antiproton would have opposite signs. This means an odoron is something which can lead to differences in proton-proton and proton antiproton scattering. And this is something which, which, which uh, I will back, come back to later on because this is an experimental feature which we can find the data and really proving there is a difference, we can go back to saying, yeah, there must be the other one because this is kind of a smoking gun of this object. So up to now, I was trying to introduce what the, what the other one is, somewhat how this happened historically, again, really skipping lots of details. But as a physicist, I'm not really satisfied because I would like to know what that other one is. So for that, I have um, two more slides. So this is kind of trying to at least uh, mimic an answer to that question. So in general, what should that be? What is the object which is exchanged between the protons? Um, and quite uh, generally, this is supposed to be an object which is color neutral. Why I'm saying this? Because maybe look, look first on this at the diagram. So suppose that the two protons would exchange a gluon. Gluons, as I said, they are in a regime where the coupling is, is big. So the gluons would like to kind of couple to other gluons and emit more gluons. So in this kind of color exchange, what would happen, there would be lots of other gluon radiation, and this would um, go to some other particles. So you would never have in the final state um, just two, uh, two protons. So simply by observing two protons and nothing else in the final state, we can tell that, that the object which is, which is exchanged must be color neutral. Um, second observation is that probably that object would be gluon rich. So after all, the gluons are the carriers of the strong force. And another argument is we are looking at large S. We are looking at small t. So actually, uh, the, the momentum fraction we probe in the proton here in this vertex or the other one is very small. And then if you look on the, on, on the um, PDFs of the proton at the small, small x, these are the, the gluon PDFs which dominate. So the object with the exchange is probably really rich in gluons. And um, maybe now I will try to evoke back the, the, the picture when I was talking about um, the correspondence between a rigid trajectory and some real states, uh, real particles. So up to now, uh, let's say I, I built the, the picture that there is some, some rigid trajectory and then this is supposed to be linked to objects which are kind of color neutral, gluon rich. So the good question could be, what would be the, the real particles or real states linked to that? And uh, the answer would be kind of glue ball. So what is a glue ball? Glue ball would be really a state of matter which is purely consisting of gluons. Um, I found somewhere this kind of um, artist representation of that could be. So what do, you, what do you have on the left side? This would be the ordinary matter where you have three um, valence quarks which are held together by these wiggly lines, which are the gluons, but the glue ball would be kind of of this thing. There are no valence quarks. These are just the gluons which hold together together um, just by, by, by themselves. So this was just a uh, general introduction, what that should be kind of from first principles. And then on the next slide, number 10, a uh, few comments about few theories which actually come to the uh, concept of uh, Orderon or Pomeron, um, both of them. So the first one is the perturbative QCD. I mean, of course, here the danger is 
that you do your perturbative calculations and try to extrapolate to a non-perturbative uh, regime or um, domain. So uh, in principle, this program may fail. Nevertheless, um, I think it's interesting, at least for the kind of perturbative, non-perturbative transition region where, where, where these calculations may, may well hold. So that people actually, if they consider these kind of parallax diagrams where you have these vertical lines um, and then you have the connections here. So um, I, I drew the, the, the diagrams with two and three and so on. There can be four uh, and, and higher order terms, but you need at least two. You need two to actually um, um, have the color neutral object, because if you have one, you have nothing else to kind of compensate the color. And um, these, these ranks here, they, they sort of represent the way that the gluons, they really want to couple to the things. But here, what I'm trying to say that uh, the couplings are only internal to this object, which is exchanged. There are no couplings which go outside. So this necessity of gluons to couple, this is kind of um, um, realized internally to that object. And then what, what is a big difference between the left-hand side diagram and the right-hand side diagram is if you have just two vertical lines, uh, it can be shown uh, by algebra that this can only make a contribution which is crossing even. That means that it would make the same sign contribution to proton-proton and proton-antiproton scattering. While if you have three, then uh, this can give also crossing out contribution. So the first one, this is, which is kind of lower order, this would be Pomeron. And then the high order, this could be the other one, which can somewhat answer the question why the Pomeron is kind of more important because this is lower order um, effects. Then uh, another um, theory which is kind of helpful in that um, respect is the latest QCD. Um, I, I am no way expert for that one, but maybe just a couple of uh, words of what that is. So people try to discretize the, the space time um, with a lattice. So they put the, uh, uh, the, the quarks in the nodes and the, uh, the glons on, on the links between that, and they perform a numerical calculation of what the QCD would be on this finite and discretized lattice. And then they try to shrink the, uh, the lattice parameter, the distance between the nodes, and extrapolate would be the, the, uh, the continuous limit. Uh, it's by far not evident, it's difficult, there are many approximations in that, but if you look on the spectrum, you really find that the, the gluons, they really form the glue ball. So there are states which are entirely and only made out of gluons, um, which is kind of reassuring. And the last thing which is kind of modern, this is this ADS CFD correspondence. Again, no way I'm, I'm, I'm an expert on that, but it's kind of interesting because this is the conjecture by, by Juan Madacena uh, about the duality between a field theory, which could be the QCD, and a kind of quantum gravity theory, which is um, on this entire Sitter space. And the interesting property of this duality is that, that you have a link between a strongly and weakly coupled theory. So if you have QCD in the non-perturbative regime, which is the very strong and difficult to solve by perturbative means, you can make this duality and look on this um, on the other side where the theory is weakly coupled. So this is much easier to, to, uh, to handle. And again, you get um, kind of evidence that there should be things like the Pomeron and the other one, which, which, which I tried to introduce before. Um, yeah, the last slide before I, I change the topic. So here what I'm showing is the differential cross-section of the elastic scattering. The elastic scattering is a very simple process. So there is just essentially one parameter for the dynamics, which is the T, the four momentum transfer squared. And what I'm showing is simply because it has kind of a typical shape, and I will make references to this, so, so I wanted to introduce. 
And also what is kind of interesting that uh, in different T regions, th there might be different physics. So let me comment it going from left to right. So if one looks at the really very, very small T values, uh, there might be an interference be between the electromagnetic and strong interaction um, because not only protons are interacting via the strong interaction, but they are also charged. So there, there is kind of Coulomb scattering happening also, and this is happening really at the very, very, very lowest T values. Then there is a part which is typically called the diffraction cone, and this is the non perturbative regime. So we are talking about uh, T values which are point something, so really very small momentum transfers. Um, and this would be the region where, where to look for the pomeron and, and maybe maybe odoron. Uh, they, they should be seen here. And then something happens and there is a typical structure of a dip and a bump, which fairly much looks like kind of an interference pattern. So um, one can really think that, 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 that there is some interference happening. And then if you look at the very high T, then uh, there is probably some, some transition to um, perturbative uh, uh, physics then. Good, uh, some comments about the typical uh, typical experimental apparatus. So we are talking about protons which get to, to very small angles. Uh, this means they essentially stay in the beam and they stay in the beam pipe. So we need um, the ticket apparatus to, uh, to see these protons. Uh, and I will describe it on, on an example of the totem experiment. And the idea is essentially to turn the accelerator, the LHC, into a magnetic spectrometer. So uh, what one does that between the interaction point, this IP, uh, and the detectors, which are called RPs, Roman ports, I will come to that on, on the next slide. You, you see there are many magnets, this Q, this means quadrupole, and D, this is dipole. So you can use all these magnets to kind of deflect the, the protons with a small scattering angle out of the beam. And then here at the detector location where you can put tracking detectors by the position of the room, uh, the, the proton, you can, you can go back to the IP and, 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 and determine what, what was the scattering angle and so on. Um, here, there are a few pictures. Uh, so I said that we call these like the Roman ports, ports because it is actually the shape of a port, and Roman because the first group which invented this device was from Rome. That's why we call them Roman ports. So uh, here you see there is a bellow, so all, all this part can move up and down, and this is necessary because we can only insert the detectors inside the beam pipe once the beam is stable. Uh, before that, we need to retract them into safe position to avoid there are, there are any, any, any troubles. Um, this is a picture from really from the tunnel. So you see that there are, there's one pipe, the other pipe, that one, this is bringing the protons to the interaction. The other one, this is the, the beam pipe with the outgoing protons. And here you see there is one Roman port which is moving horizontally, another port which is moving vertically and so on. Inside the ports, we, we have a stack of silicon detectors, which are then shown in detail here. Uh, these are strip detectors and they are always mounted back to back. So there is one which has the strip direction in this way and there is a strip on the other one, which is perpendicular. That's why we can reconstruct both coordinates. And then uh, there is this edge, which is facing the beam. And this is kind of special uh, because there is very little insensitive margin because we really want to go as close to the beam as possible in order you know, to avoid there is a kind of dead space. Um, yeah, here I just wanted to say that there are many difficulties on the theoretical side for the elastic scattering, but on the side of the, let's say, the experimental signature, this is much easier. As we talk about an elastic scattering, we have two protons which emerge from the same vertex and uh, with opposite direction. So you can look really for the signature. And here I just put uh, some correlation plots. For example, here between the angles, and you see this is the angle which is measured in the left arm of the spectrometer, in the right arm of the spectrometer, and then you have um, in hand 
really um, um, a, a lot of correlations which you can employ. And that's why you're really sure that what you measure is the elastic scattering. Um, so this was a kind of still introduction. So now I will start discussing uh, the two uh, different um, pieces of evidence that we have for the existence of the Odoron. And the first one, the first evidence, this is coming from the comparison of the proton-proton to the proton anti proton measurements, which I said, this is what makes an Odoron really this, 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 this difference. So uh, the program for, for this is really to compare the cross sections from proton proton and proton anti proton collisions. And uh, where should we be looking at? As I said, we have at least two regions or two objects which might contribute to, to high energy differential cross section, which is the pomeron, which is the dominant one, and the odoron. Uh, we want to look for that one, which is probably a small contribution. So we need to be looking at a place where the pomeron amplitude is somewhat suppressed. Um, and we also need to be looking in a region where the odoron amplitude is not alone, because we need an interference or that amplitude with something else to make actually the different sign of the other amplitude visible in the cross section. If the other one was the same, if you take the amplitude which might have a different sign, but you put the absolute square when you go from amplitude to the cross section, this would uh, this difference would disappear. And from that point of view, uh, this dip bump region, this interference region, I was uh, trying to um, uh, show you before. And then there is actually a, a sequence of if then statements, because if we observe um, the difference in the differential cross section, it's saying that there must be a difference in the amplitude level. If there is a difference in the amplitude level, then there must be some crossing odd component in, in the amplitude. And then which is kind of important is only if there is nothing else that can be crossing out contribution to the amplitude, then we can attribute that difference to the other arm. Um, I will come to this a bit, bit later. So actually, this is something people have been thinking about for, for a long time, and they, they even tried to make a measurement here. What I'm showing this is um, uh, the first one, which is coming from the CERN intersecting asteroid rings, which was uh, probably the first collider ever. So this was uh, done in the 1980s at the energy of 53 GeV. And there you see a comparison of proton anti-proton, which are the hollow dots, and proton proton, which are the, the black dots. And then you see there is a difference. Uh, you also see that the error bars, they are not negligible. So the number of points where you can really have um, kind of big difference is small. Then there are a few points where actually they overlap with the error bar. So, most likely the statistical significance of this observation would not be very, very huge. Um, then some people even had some doubts about the data and so on. But what I think is, is the biggest drawback of this, of this um, kind of attempt is, is the energy. Because at the small energies, maybe in the beginning, you remember I, I was saying, we not, not only have the Pomeron and the other, we have also the kind of normal mesonic regions but their contribution dies of it with energy. But at small energies like that one, you cannot exclude that other crossing art regions might exist. And that's why if this difference is really true, you might be able to explain that one even without the other one. That's why most people were not really convinced about that, um, that argument. However, this is a great motivation or a great example of what can be done really at high energies. And this is, this is probably the main point of this presentation that this was redone together um, by Totem at the LHC and D0 at Tevatron. So at Tevatron, uh, they had um, the collisions of protons with anti-protons at the energy of 1.96 TV. 
um, LAT is colliding uh, protons with protons, and it can go as low as 0.9 TV in energy. However, if you want to see the dip bump structure, and I try to motivate why we want to see that structure, then we need to be at the energy at least 2.7 or so. So the program is quite um, straightforward. We take the measurements by totem, which were done at four energies, ranging from 2.7 to 6 up to 13 TeV. We would extrapolate these measurements to the energy where, where D0 made the measurements in P and Ti P, and we make the comparison. The important point here is that if you manage to do this, the theoretical interpretation is going to be much easier because we are talking about TeV scale of the energies, where theoreticians really only expect that Pomeron and Oderon would, would contribute to. So, then if we manage to prove there is a difference, then we can be quite sure that this can be attributed to the other one. Um, some, some more details. So here I'm showing the measurements at the four energies by totem, and you see they're kind of similar. So you always have this part which goes down, then dip, then the bump, and go, go down. Um, you can also see some trends. So if you, for example, look at the dip, then with the energy, it always moves kind of to smaller values of T and higher values of, of uh, D sigma over DT. So at the end, when we do the extrapolation, we have quite some, uh, some trends to be checked. Um, so we have some handles to make sure that the extrapolation is kind of reasonable. How, how this was done, uh, that we identified eight control or characteristic points through the shape of the distribution. So dip, bump, somewhere in the middle and so on. So we had these eight points and we identified these eight points at all the four energy measurements we, we had. And then we put them in a plot. So um, again, quite a busy plot, but this is just showing uh, in different colors you see for example, the bump, the dip, and so on, the position in T and the uh, differential cross-section value at that point as a function of the energy. So then we have the, the four measurements by, by totem. This is that one, that one, that one, and that one. And we want to extrapolate to the energy of the, of the D0, which are the stars. So you can already see that the lever arm, which we have is much longer than this small piece over which we need to extrapolate. Um, then in order to do the extrapolation, we, we made a fit. Um, these are the fitting functions which we used. I and mean, of course, this is nothing which is cut in stone. So uh, you can ask why we use those fits. And one of the answers is yes, because it's discussed the data. And then what I find is kind of magic that the same parametrization actually works fairly well for uh, different points, um, which is by far not obvious because maybe I scroll back. When I was describing this curve, I was saying that at different t's, this can make maybe really different physics, which may evolve differently with, with the energy, but no. We, you see, I mean, all the lines are almost parallel, so, and they describe very well the data. So um, I think we've managed to find uh, something which uh, probably has some, some, some at least small uh, grain of truth inside. So at this moment, we could extrapolate these eight control points to the energy of, of, of the zero, um, which is shown on the next slide. These are the, the black crosses, these are the eight points, but, this is still kind of a discrete information. We, we need to have something smooth, which interpolates for different T values because we want to compare at, um, with the measurements of D0 where they made the measurements at, at their T values. So what we did, we, we, we had um, um, kind of um, T dependence, which we tested with all the measurements by, by totem at the four energies. So, uh, presumably this is a parametrization which would also work for the extrapolation and we made the fit. So this is kind of uh, simple. And we also use that fit to propagate the uncertainty. So we made a series of um, Monte Carlo pseudo experiments where we know that these extrapolated points, they have uncertainty. So we kind of put to their position up and down according to uh, the uncertainty model. 
and then repeated the fits. We discarded the fits, which are uh, unreasonable, and we were left with this color coded onset of the event. So then we know what is the, the extrapolation from, from totem, um, which is then compared to the zero on, on this slide. There is an important detail which, which, which I'm not going to um, discuss that actually to get better significance, we also try to find a common normalization in different words to kind of figure out normalization uncertainties, which are not necessary for, for the comparison as we are doing a relative comparison. Then um, you, you see the D0 measurements by uh, for proton antiproton. These are the blue blue points, which actually don't have any dip. That doesn't go down and up compared to the proton proton, which really goes down and goes up and goes down again. So um, I, I think qualitatively, this is quite easy. See, there's a difference. Then what you can do, you can make, for example, the, the chi-square compatibility test, and you will find out there is a difference at the level of 3.4 sigma. Um, yeah, there is another detail that you need to determine the right number of degrees of freedom uh, and so on. Uh, so, okay, so from that point of view, we, we have an, a kind of hand, there is something happening at 3.4 sigma. Um, then the last part, um, which is um, another piece of evidence for the existence of the other one from the so-called raw parameter. So you can ask, and this is a good question, what is the raw parameter? And the definition is here. So it's defined as the ratio of the real to the imaginary part of the elastic scattering amplitude at t equals zero. So the next good question could be why raw parameter as this looks as a quite synthetic definition. And the reason for that is, is again, the theory prediction, which says that for Pomeron, um, the amplitude at t equals zero is predominantly imaginary. Why from the other one, this would be real. So I'm coming back to the fact that the Pomeron is, is much more important typically than the other one. So we are looking for um, um, quantities where we could see this smaller other on contribution. So if the Pomeron is typically imaginary, then the contribution to the real part would be small. And essentially most of what we see in the real part would be coming from the other one. So, uh, to put it short, raw is sensitive to the contributions from the other one. But then the problem comes, uh, raw is essentially related to the, to the phase. And if, uh, and typically the phase would go out the moment you take the square and you go from the amplitude to the, the cross section. However, here I come to something which I've been neglecting almost through uh, the talk that uh, the protons have electric charge. So there is also kind of electromagnetic or Coulomb scattering. So then when you calculate the, the cross section, you have the Coulomb part, you have the strong amplitude or, or nuclear amplitude and they can interfere. So uh, if you know this one from, the, from, from QED, for example, you can determine what is the phase of, of the other one. So this is the trick we, we, which we use to actually determine the, uh, the, the raw parameter and is, uh, is the interference between electromagnetic and the nuclear one. As usual, there are details. So, so you can also imagine kind of Feynman diagrams with both QED and QCD uh, exchanges. I, I will not go into that one. Um, this is just a kind of visual uh, representation, what I was saying before. So uh, this is the differential cross-section as a function of t. And there are three contributions. Uh, the green one, this is only from, from electromagnetic or Coulomb. Uh, the blue one, this is only uh, from uh, strong interaction or the hydronic um, component. And the red one, if you combine both, so you see this is kind of interpolating between these two. And then the next thing, which you can see, there is a small gap between blue and red. And this is the interference I was talking about. So this small thing here, this is uh, sensitive to the value of the raw, or this is sensitive to the phase of this hydronic amplitude. When, of course, you can say, yeah, this is a small effect. Would you ever have sensitivity to actually measure this? And for that, I have the next slide. So 
Um, these two plots, they show the, the differential cross-section in a kind of relative coordinates with respect to some reference as a function of t. That the top one, this is uh, a simulation for different values of rho. Uh, so you, you see there, there are kind of different levels or magnitudes of the interference, and you see what is the different uh, distance between the curves. And um, on the bottom, these are the really the measurements. Uh, these are the black points. So we see the, the error bars are quite small. And then if you have quite a few points, so it's perfectly possible to distinguish between, between these curves. So we do have the sensitivity to, to do this measurement. Um, and these are our results. They are put in a kind of word compilation of the data. So this is raw versus uh, square root of s. And um, these are the measurements by totem, these two points. Why we are putting these two points there is because this kind of represents the uncertainty because of um, using different fit techniques, different fit models, and so on. So we kind of bracket the truth between these two points. And you see these two points are distinctly different from the extrapolation from the smaller energies so from, from this curve. So. Um, then you can calculate what is the level of incompatibility of our observation with respect to this um, uh, prediction. And this is more than four, four sigmas. Um, at this point, you can say, yes, so maybe totem did a good measurement, but maybe this extrapolation is completely wrong. Maybe this model is wrong. Um, we, we, we spent some time analyzing that and, and, and some answer is on, uh, on slide number 30. And actually, it's not our answer. It's, it's answered by the COMPETE collaboration who, who did uh, quite a comprehensive study before actually LAT was started. And they, they took into consideration a large number of models uh, to describe um, total cross-section and the raw parameter for different reactions, proton protons, also uh, kaons and so on. So they had quite some data. Um, and out of these, 256 models, when they were confronted with data, they retained 23 models being kind of good quality. And the prediction for the model from these 23 models are, are put a, a, into these uh, plots. So the left-hand side plot, this is showing the total cross-section as a function of the energy, while the right-hand side plot, this is showing the raw as a function of the energy. And then what you can see in the plots that um, all the model predictions, they cluster in kind of three bands, the blue band, the magenta one, and, and the green band. And then uh, in red, there are different measurements by totem. And you see that when we talk about the total cross-section, only the red points, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, only the blue uh, models are compatible with the data. While when we talk about raw, only the green models are compatible with the measurement. So there is no model whatsoever which would satisfy both the constraints from the signal taught and the constraints from rho. I forgot to mention one very important thing. Compete had the models without or their own. Um, so this kind of excludes all the models which were, um, which were considered by Compete. And still one could say, yeah, so Compete didn't take into consideration the right models, but there is something called dispersion relations. And this kind of says, when you take the, these relations without the other one, it says that the row should be proportional to the rate of growth of sigma taught with the energy, which is saying that whenever the sigma taught would be uh, growing fast, you would have the row higher. So the trend which is shown in these plots and it's particularly shown for some models, it's more general. So there is no escape whenever you don't have another one. So from that slide, I, I think uh, we are able to, to show that no matter what you do, if you don't have another one, you, you, you can't get com uh, compliant with the data. So the last thing which you may say, so now you have shown that without other one, you can't really reconcile data and the theory. And the last piece is, so do you have a model with another one which can describe the data? 
And here there are just two, uh, two models with some degrees of um, inclusion of the other one. And you, here you see, for example, if, if I take the, the blue one, the one by, by Nicolescu, that it goes quite well through the points of, of total cross-section, and then it goes quite well also through the points of the, of, of the raw measurement. So the answer is yes, there, there are models which can describe the data, and these models do include uh, the other one. Um, yeah, and th this gets me to the to the to the to the summary. So, I was talking a little bit about the theory, how the Pomeron and and the other um, concepts were were created, that these are mediator objects uh, which are exchanged and and forward physics processes at high energies, and and these concepts they they actually emerge in in, in different theories. They are a bit different things, but uh, in sort of um, similar characteristics. I, I mentioned some of those. And then um, focusing particularly on the other one, this is uh, an object which is crossing out, which means this can introduce difference between proton, proton, and proton, anti-proton. And then this was used as a signature in the experimental search. Um, I try to motivate a little bit what that is. And um, in, for example, looking in the perturbative QCD, this would be a kind of a bound state, putting in really in quotes of at least three gluons. Uh, as I was saying, if you have only two gluons, you cannot have the crossing out exchange. So you need at least three gluons. Um, I, I tried to show with really few slides how um, the apparatus uh, for, for, for detectors would look like for, for um, the forward physics, because it's quite different from, from, from other detectors, and um, that we have special detectors called Roman pulse, which, which are really inserted into the beam pipe to be very close to, to, the, to the beams. And at the end, uh, I, I tried to show you two pieces of evidence um, that the other one does exist. One was by comparing proton-proton with proton-antiproton, uh, measurements, uh, one by totem, the other one by D0, and the other one, which was more technical, was by analyzing the raw parameter, which is measured by, by totem. Um, I, I would like to emphasize that actually both um, analyses were kind of model independent. We, we didn't look on very specific predictions or very specific models. We really focused on what makes the other on the other on like the difference between proton, proton, and, and proton, anti-proton. And we are kind of happy that we, whenever we try to, uh, to get there with different approaches, we always get to the same results. So uh, we are kind of confident that we, we can claim the discovery. Looking um, on the statistics, if you combine the significance from these two pieces of evidence, we get sufficiently above, above five, no matter model we take. So uh, I think we, we can really claim the discovery, um, which is in principle, everything which, which I prepared. A, a small comment is on the last slide. So uh, when I was preparing this presentation, um, this is mostly, mostly based on, on kind of these four, four, four um, resources. The first two, these are kind of books or reviews. And the last two, these are references to the papers um, about these two different pieces of evidence, the, the difference, and this is the raw one. And then uh, I actually came across uh, a very small write-up of, of a lecture, uh, which despite the name, it actually contains quite nice description of the theory, like the, um, the, the Regia theory and and and, and, and but about the QCD um, um, about uh, the things which are used in the forward physics, and it's quite short. It has thirteen pages. It contains references to other work. So I, I thought if th there is a student who would be interested in looking at this, this would be kind of good for the reading um, resource. And this is fairly much I prepared, so I can stop now. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much. I mean, this is a sort of difficult specialized topic and it was one of the clearest lectures I've, uh, I've heard about this. Any questions? Um, Emerson. I can Hi. 
Yeah, go Can ahead. You hear me? Okay. Yes. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for the beautiful and detailed seminar, Ian. Second, the discovery of other is very welcome news for the theoretical community. But I have a question regarding the value of the row parameter announced by the Totten collaboration. I suppose you know some recent work showing that in principle, the row, val the row value <coughs> measured by Totten can be a little bit higher. For example, there is a paper from Ezela Petrovi and Tikachenko, for example, <coughs> they are using the same nuclear amplitude used by Totten, but a modified formula for the Coulomb nuclear interference term, the value of the whole is larger than the denotized by the Totten. So I would, I would like to know your opinion about this, this reanalysis of the Totten data. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the question. I um, particularly don't know about this reanalysis, but I have been in, in very close contact with Vladimir Petrov about his supposedly new formula. And um, I, I spend lots of time analyzing what, what he proposes because as you said, this could have potentially a detrimental effect to our measurement. So I try to redo the calculations and I actually made a publication a few 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 months ago about this. So I, I read out the, the calculation really starting from the very beginning. So I, I use the uh, the Econola framework. I make all the calculations numerically <laughs> to make sure that I don't make any mistake on the analytical level. And this purely numerical calculation could confirm the let's say analytical formula which we were using for for the analysis so my personal opinion is that um I, I think we are kind of safe and sure that the formula which you use for the analysis is correct um okay. then if you like i i can point you to the uh to the, to the paper which which i wrote about that if you're interested yes i'm interested but you know also the work from, from there is a paper from Julia Pancheri, Isriva Stava, and <laughs> Do you know this paper? Um, no, this one, I don't they, know. Yeah, they use a modified version of the nuclear amplitude. And again, the values of rho parameter is larger. I, I think the, the point of uh, this Italian group is, is related with, um, how can I say? Um, um, if I remember, it's the observer that a zero in the real part of nuclear amplitude lies in the Coulomb nuclear region. So, um, uh, if I remember, the Totten has assumed a constant real part of the nuclear amplitude near to t equal to zero. And I think, I, if I remember the Punkeris paper treat this and says that it's not possible to consider a constant real part of nuclear amplitude because a theorem from Andre Martin or something like that. Do, do you know this work? I, I, I do not know this work, I need to read it. I mean, in principle, yes, there is a theorem from Andre Martin saying that somewhere, somewhere, and I underline this work, somewhere there, there should be the zero in the real part, but it doesn't specify okay. where. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not, as far as I know, it's not very, um, let's say, um, quantitative. Then we didn't use uh, the assumption of constant real part. We use the assumption of constant row. So this would be constant ratio between the real and the imaginary part. Then wow. we did, didn't, didn't make specific, Actually, there were two, two publications uh, which we did. So there was one at 13 TV where we could um, get really precise results because we had lots of statistics. But then we also have an analysis at 8 TV. And 8 TV, we, we spent much more time. So there we probe different options. So we, uh, we have made fits with kind of constant row assumption and also what we call peripheral. So this would be a kind of different, um, uh, different um, assumption on how the phase evolves with T. And surprise, actually, we didn't expect this. We, we got exactly the same value of, of, of rho. So 
Um, yeah, if the situation is the same at 13 TB, probably the choice of the phase dependence on T may not make a huge difference. And there is one more point. Uh, the point is here we are comparing the measurement at 13 TV to previous measurements. So suppose that everything would now be reanalyzed with a different formula. Maybe everything would shift with a little bit up or up and down, but what counts is the difference. What counts is the, de uh, the delta. You see, I mean, if you want to make uh, the comparison and, and make a statement about compatibility or incompatibility, this is the delta. So even now, if you would use different formula and everything would shift consistently up and down, there would be no difference. So what is particularly important to us that we make a comparison with a method which was similar to the previous analyses. And then if you look in, um, in the literature, how this was done in the past, how people expected to grow, this was done with some method. Um, here, I, I was saying that um, here, the lower point is most similar conditions to the UA4, for example, and so on. So although at 13 TV, we didn't exploit or the different uh, assumptions on this or on that, we at least have the one assumption, which is quite close to what people did before, which is the constant row assumption. And in that way, we hope that we are kind of consistent with the other points. And that's why we uh, keep the right difference between the, the extrapolation and, and, and our measurement. So uh, yeah, it, it's not a definite answer, but I, I think we have put in place several kind of protections that our, our kind of conclusion is, is, is the, the right yeah, one. I, I understand. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. Mm. Further questions? I actually, I have two. Yes, but um, Yeah, the sort of, just as a qualitatively, where does the dip and the hump, which seems to be pretty universal, what is the physical explanation for that? <laughs> this is $1 million question. So I, I can <laughs> tell you that, that every model has a different explanation. So I, I think most, well, I, let, let me go to that slide. Most models I know of, and I don't pretend I know all of them, they kind of explain this as a kind of interference between different amplitudes. So there is a model which has one amplitude, which is describing that part. There is a model, uh, an amplitude, which is this part. And then we get the bump, which is the interference between this component and that component, for example. So like Pomeron. So yeah, th th this is kind of a Pomeron and this was an Omega exchange. Uh, this was the model by Islam, for example. There are different models which um, have kind of, yeah, so, so far I was always drawing the diagrams where you exchange one thing, but if you really have this S to the alpha dependence, this can go forever. You need some mechanism for unitarization. So you can have also a diagram which would be going like this, and then you exchange multiple things. So then you can have one amplitude, which is a single, exchange you have another amplitude which is multiple or it's kind of two and so on and again you get interference um, and then you probably have um, um, different models with different interpret interpretations so so as far as i can tell there is no uh, consensus of what that is exactly supposed to be Can you still hear me actually? Yes, I can, I, I can. Good. But there was inter uh, an interruption for some second, but I think now is okay. Um, I see a message that Giorgio went to waiting room. Okay.
Jojo, can you hear us? Hello. I think Giorgio had some problem. Yeah, let's wait a little bit. <laughs> Maybe he comes back. Yes. Hi, I'm very sorry. Something happened with my internet and it kicked me out. It, but you're uh, back. <laughs> yeah, I'm back. I'm I, I'm sorry about this. Don't worry, no problem. It's uh, an issue of the 24. Uh, it's been an issue of the of this period of giving seminars. All right, thanks. I guess it's it's destiny. The gods of electricity saying that this was. I will have one final question since you survived since you survived up until now. I mean, sort of in modern quantum field theory, um, the a definition of a particle is a peak in the spectral function, which basically means that it's there a T channel at S channel and at U channel, you will, you will see a peak. This is not the way of thinking about the other, right? Since it only appears at T, there is no way to look for it for in the S channel or in the U channel. I mean, I mean, in principle, yes. I mean, if it exists in the T channel, it should use also exist in the T in the S channel. So there are experiments which are looking uh, really at the production. So, uh, for example, you could have a proton. You could have a proton. There would be a pom. Uh, yeah, you can have some particles. Uh, now I can, yeah, you can have a mixture of, for example, a pomeron, you could have um, a gamma, and I think you can create an odoron, which would decay to something. So th th these are kind of experiments looking uh, in general for glue balls. And then if you, if you combine the, uh, the quantum numbers correctly, you can really look for a glue ball, which would have the quantum numbers of, of, the, um, of the odoron. So this is also possible. It's kind of a different thing, but uh, what you say is perfectly right, uh, which I was trying also to say in the beginning. So, so the amplitude which you get, this is, this is universal. This is in T channel, this is an S channel. So you get something in the T channel, in the S channel, you should really see the resonances or bound states, the, the peaks you were talking about. So. Yeah, this should be one thing which can be seen maybe a bit differently, but in in different different channels. So there are uh, there are things being done. Okay. Thank thank you very much. Um, I, I see there is also Graziano who has who has uh, raised hand. Oh, please oh, okay. yes, please thank go ahead. Uh, just a uh, a question. If we assume there are interferences between electromagnetic and the nuclear interactions for low T, these inter interferences are interactions pre predictable or outside the th theoretical model. Um, so there are theories which tell how to combine the, the Coulomb with the nuclear amplitude. The nuclear amplitude is an input 
to this calculation because this this is an object which we cannot predict from first principles. But suppose that someone gives you how this amplitude looks like. There are ways how to calculate that thing. Um, so kind of the combined effect of the Coulomb in, uh, Coulomb interaction and the nuclear one. Uh, there are a different different approaches. One is really kind of take this uh, this kind of Feynman diagram and try to calculate the dominant contribution to this one. The other approach is based on the Aconal framework, where you transform the, the Coulomb interaction to an Aconal, the nuclear interaction into Aconal, and then you say, I assume that the Aconals are additive. You sum these Aconals and you make the transformation back to, to the D space and uh, you get the full amplitude. W was this clear? Okay, okay, thank you. I understand. Okay, thanks for your question. Thanks, I'm sorry. I didn't notice the hand up because I had to reboot everything. Yeah. Further questions? If not, if not, last chance. Thank you very, very much for, for a great talk. I'm stopping the recording right now.